Please welcome to the stage, Sarah Fats. It's the middle of the night. There is a cold, hard frost on the ground. I've been on the run for nearly two weeks. I am soaked through, I am freezing cold, and I'm hungry. And I'm supposed to be meeting a friendly agent at an RV who's going to take me to safety. And no one turns up. Eventually, a Land Rover roars into view. Four men get out the back of the Land Rover, shouting at me. They grab me, they put a bag over my head, they handcuff me, and they bundle me into the back of a Land Rover. This is resistance to interrogation training. This is the training that helicopter pilots have to go through before they deploy to unfriendly territories, shall we say. And I've got a pretty good idea of what's coming next because people like to tell stories about this training. So I know that I'm now going to get taken to a concrete cell and interrogated and tortured. And that's going to consist of mock executions, sleep deprivation, static noise, dress positions. It's designed to prepare you for what the enemy is going to do if you're shot down. And the enemy's got one aim, and that's to break you. So I know this training is going to be incredibly unpleasant. But I have a plan. So I knew that one of the first things that was going to happen was that I would be stripped down to my underwear. And I have a particularly ridiculous pair of superhero underpants <laughs> that I'm quite fond of. So I decide I'm going to wear these pants because I had this kind of hunch that it might just deflect a bit of the heat away from me. And it worked. I remember the, my captors kind of mid-jeer, their jaws just dropped and they were momentarily speechless. And I remember thinking, you know, you can take all of my other choices away from me today. You can decide when I eat. You can decide when I sleep. You can even decide when I go to the loo. But you don't get to decide what pants I put on this morning. And shivering in that cell, I felt strong. And I felt powerful. And I felt resilient. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about why power is the key to true resilience in this uncertain age. So how resilient are we feeling? Well, 93% of the UK workforce are complaining of well-being issues right now. So not very resilient. 86% of them believe that their employer is part of the problem. So your instinctive response to that information might very well be to try and do more for your people, try and help them, try and fix them. But what if I told you that the more you try and help your people, the more you try and fix the problem, the more powerless they'll feel. And actually it could be making it worse. Because here's another st statistic. 90% of well-being initiatives fail within the first four months. So if we really want to create resilient teams, we need to understand why this is happening. And I think I know why. Because happiness is a choice. It is a choice that every individual has to make for themselves. No matter how much you want to bring happiness to people, you cannot make them feel something they don't choose to feel. So people have to make that choice for themselves. And right now, I don't think they are. And because they're not making that choice, they are feeling powerless. And because of that, they're feeling pretty miserable. So we need to understand why they are not making those choices. And it turns out, it's not really their fault. I'd like to do a little experiment with you. I'm going to prove to you that we're actually kind of hardwired to give our choices away. So for the next 30 seconds, I just want you to focus on your breathing. Nothing else. And if you get distracted by thoughts or sounds or anything else, just make a note of it 
and come back to your breathing. We're going to do that now for 30 seconds. How do you get on? Anyone get distracted? Anyone start thinking about other things? So when you're distracted, that is your brain doing something you didn't ask it to do. That is you giving away your focus, your attention, and not consciously steering it. And it's not your fault, by the way. We spend about 50% of our waking day distracted not steering our attention, because the brain likes to conserve energy. It likes to revert to the autopilot, which means it is delegating its choices to the automatic part of the brain. By the way, marketers know this. This is why when you're kind of scrolling on your phone, something will pop up on your feed, some shiny new gadget, and then before you know it, you've just bought something you didn't even know you wanted. Because marketers know that your attention is the most valuable commodity of the 21st century, and yet we are hardwired to give it away. So we are hardwired to give our choices away about something as basic and fundamental as our attention. But it's not just our hardwiring. The conditions count for a lot too. So let's just think about that. Let's think about the last two years and how the government responded to COVID. Rules, lockdowns, restrictions, loads of them, often causing quite a lot of distress for people being separated from loved ones. But we followed the rules because if we didn't, we were fined or even worse, ostracised. Now, I'm not having a pop at Boris here. It's not easy to run a country in crisis. But the simple truth is this. People have gotten used to being told what to do. They've got used to following rules and they've got used to giving away their choices. So we are now at a position where COVID has created perfect conditions for people to surrender their power. And because of the autopilot, they don't even know they're doing it. It does get more cheerful from here on in, I promise. <laughs> so what can we do about it? Well, the first thing is, as individuals, as leaders, we need to disengage that autopilot. How do we do that? by choosing where you want your focus to be. Every time you do that, you're becoming more choice aware. And when you see choices around you, you see when other people are denying themselves of choices. And you'll realize it's not because they're weak or lazy, it's because they don't even know they have a choice in the first place. But how do we create the conditions for others to start exercising choices and taking their power back? You can't just go in and order people to exercise choice because that's kind of taking their choices away from them. So what are we supposed to do about this? How do we create the conditions for people to feel powerful? Well, you may have heard of the old phrase, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, I like the other phrase, with great responsibility comes great power. So if we want our people to feel powerful, we have to make space for them to take responsibility. Try this. How many rules have you got in your organisation right now? How many of them do you actually need? What if you took just one of them away? Might people start thinking for themselves and exercising choice and taking responsibility for that choice? How good would that be? This is not an easy thing to do. But I promise you that if we truly want people to feel resilient, it has to start at the top. It has to start with you. And please trust me on this. If it is possible to feel powerful <laughs> stood in your pants, it is possible to feel powerful just about anywhere. You have incredible power at your disposal. We all do, and we can give it away or we can reclaim what is already ours. What are you going to choose?
Thank you for listening.